Good morning, everyone. Um, everyone knows that um, my gift is talking, not singing, okay? <laughs> but uh, Carrie came to me. Uh, Jordan was going to lead songs this morning, and he got his back messed up, and I think he's going to get it checked out. So anyhow, <clears throat> you will find me introducing songs and stepping back and singing, okay? Uh, <clears throat> so you'll know. That's uh, not my gift by any means. Um, Shine, Jesus, shine. Thank you. <clears throat> Pardon me? Hey, yeah, let's stand. There we go. <laughs> Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth you now bring us. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Place, spirit, place. Set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow. For the nations with grace and mercy. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, want to thank you this morning that you have blessed us with the good minds and good bodies we're able to be out here today and just to worship you together as a uh, body of believers. We uh, thank you, Lord, that uh, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, that uh, we can come here with the faithfulness of knowing that uh, there's a great reward waiting for us as a uh, body of believers. And we just pray that we live this life in a manner that's pleasing to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I stand in awe. You are beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. Who can grasp your of your love you are beautiful beyond description majesty enthroned above and I stand I stand in awe of you I stand I stand in awe of you holy God to whom all praise is due I stand in Yet God crushed you for my sin In agony and deep affliction Cut off that I might enter in Who can grasp such tender compassion? Who can fathom this mercy so free? You are beautiful beyond description Lamb of God who died for me, I stand, I stand in awe of you, I stand, I stand in awe of you, holy 
do a communion meditation. I'd like to uh, go from um, a reading from um, 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 12 through 15. So I will always remind you of these things even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth that you now have. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body because I know that I will soon put it aside, as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. I found a story here, a guy talking about his Uncle Dan, okay? His Uncle Dan used to say, and that's whatever your Uncle Dan used to say. In my case, it's probably Uncle Gerald, okay? But this guy talks about his Uncle Dan. I think it hits really close to home. Uh, it was often said by Uncle Dan enough times that you remembered it. It became his slogan, his trademark. Now, whenever you hear this saying or face this situation, you think of Uncle Dan. And when you think of Uncle Dan, you hear him saying it again. Members of the family used to smile knowingly whenever Uncle Dan would start to say it again, and someone might even interrupt and finish the saying for him. Some thought that he was losing his memory in his old age and so was becoming repetitious. Perhaps that's true. On the other hand, Uncle Dan may have been more concerned with your remembering than he with his. Maybe he was willing to be thought a bit foolish if by doing so he could leave some jewel of wisdom permanently with you. That's the way it was with the Apostle Peter in his old age. He recounted again and again what Jesus said and did. He said it, and he wrote it, and then he wrote it again. His readers already knew what he was going to tell them, but they must never be allowed to forget. Life's distractions are many and demanding. They can occupy Christians' minds and make them forgetful, or at least neglectful. Peter would not always be around to remind him of Jesus, and Peter knew the Old Testament accounts of a nation that followed God as long as some notable leader was among them, but fell away after his death. It must not be allowed to happen among Peter's friends. He would remind them again and again. So it is with the weekly celebration of the Lord's table. It has, in the simplicity of the gospel, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. There are depths of scripture that's unmeasured. But the reminders in the Lord's invitation and his dedication of memorial elements, the bread and the cup, are repetitious. They are purposefully repetitious, urgently repetitious, persistently repetitious, so we don't forget what Christ did for us. Let's go to prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do live lives that are very revved up. Many times, Lord, um, we go about our daily business and don't consider you in the decisions we make. And I just pray, Lord, that we change that, that we do consider you as we go about our daily walk of life. We understand that it was a great price paid for us, Lord, and through that, that we um, have salvation that uh, can come to us uh, by just being obedient to the gospel. Lord, just at this time, as we come to our um, opportunity to be Christ-like, help us to partake of these emblems in a manner that's worthy. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
The next song is Take Time to Be Holy. Last song, God Will Make a Way. in ways we cannot 
Good morning, church. Good morning. If we've got some young'uns that are junior church age, I guess those folks need to be dismissed at this point. I'd like for the rest of you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Luke chapter 21 this morning. Luke chapter 21. We're going to use the first four verses of the chapter as our text. Luke chapter 21. As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly, I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth. But she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. Lots of times when we talk about giving and charity, we think about the folks who are most in need. People who have no food or no home. People who have very limited educational opportunities and need to be able to climb the ladder. Or maybe in the church, we think about missions and introducing people to Christ. But in fact, if you look at the statistics, only about a 25% share of all charitable giving actually goes to those kinds of needs. Another 25% of charitable giving usually goes to culture and the arts. It funds museums, it funds sports teams. And that leaves the last 50% of charitable giving mostly to go to health care and education. And a lot of that is self-serving. If you dig a little deeper, you'll find that, particularly in the world of education, a lot of it is people who have gone to college, been able to make a good living because of their college education, and then they make donations back to their alma mater. In fact, in Great Britain, in the 10-year period between 2007 and 2017, half of all the donations that were made by millionaires went to just two schools, Oxford and Cambridge. Writing in The Guardian, Paul Valley says, a lot of elite philanthropy is about elite causes. Rather than making the world a better place, it largely reinforces the world as it is. And then he goes on to say, philanthropy is always an expression of power. Giving often depends on the personal whims of super rich individuals. Sometimes those coincide with the priorities of society, but at other times they contradict or undermine them. The article goes on to point out that like in the world of political giving, if you're a conservative you hate the things that George Soros does with his money. And if you're a liberal, you hate the things that the Koch brothers have done with their money. They gave to further their own agenda. Even in Jesus' day, there were wealthy people who gave more for themselves and their own agenda than they gave to God. Jesus is sitting there in the temple. It's Passion Week, the final week of Jesus' life before he goes to the cross. 
And he's watching as people bring in their gifts. And it says, as Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. They intended it that way. The rich wanted to be noticed by their giving. Jesus has already addressed that back in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 6, he warned us, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, don't announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Sometimes the rich almost announce their gifts with trumpets. Well, maybe not literal trumpets. But in the temple where Jesus is watching the giving, there are 13 receptacles And the top of each receptacle is fluted so that it will be able to easily allow somebody to come along and and drop in their offering. Let's say that that you're feeling generous and and you decide you want to give $100 that way. There's two ways that you can give. One is that you quietly bring your $100 bill up and you drop it in the offering plate and you walk along and nobody knows the difference. The other way is to go get your $100 in quarters. Loose quarters. Clang, 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 clang. And everybody turns around to look, to see. And that's what some of the rich people were doing that way. They wanted to make everybody notice their gift. And Jesus has been thinking about that because if you look back at the end of chapter 20, remember, there's no chapter divisions in Luke's original account. Look at chapter 20, verses 46 and 47. Beware of the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and they love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places in honor at the banquet. They devour widows' homes and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. Jesus has been thinking about the people who want to call attention to themselves and make their religion all about them. And then he watches the rich people come in and some of them are giving in such a way that it's all about them. And then along comes this little widow lady. And she puts in tulepta. It's the smallest of Jewish coins. Tulepta make about one sixtieth of a day's wage. So if we're talking about making a hundred bucks a day just for round figures, this lady's putting in less than two bucks. In terms of an amount, it is not a very big offering. And yet Jesus says she's put in more than all the rest because she has, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. All the rich people wanted everybody to notice their gift. And so they'd give in a way that trumpeted their giving, that caused everybody to think, man, I wish I could give like that. How generous. But this woman quietly gives her tulepta. And God notices. Which... Would you rather be? You know, it's not the amount that marks a gift as special. In fact, maybe instead of looking at how much we give, what we really ought to ask is, how much did you keep? What did you do for yourself? Back in 2007, Genshiro Kasamoto made headlines in Hawaii when he chose eight low-income 
single moms, moms who had children at home, and he gave them the opportunity to live rent-free for the next 10 years in one of his houses. He even peeled off 10 $100 bills to each one to help them cover their moving expenses. And all that was expected of these 10 ladies, or these 8 ladies, I'm sorry, would be that they would cover the utilities during that 10-year period. Kasamoto, known for his generosity. Wow, isn't it neat that he, that he took his houses and he let poor people live in them with no charge? Except that Kasamoto still had 14 more houses to live in in Hawaii. He could pretty much go to a new one each month and, and never get bored with living in the same residence. Forbes magazine notes that if you take the 25 largest givers in the U.S., those folks have donated more than $169 billion to charitable causes. Mackenzie Scott, for example, the ex-wife of Amazon founder Jeff Bezos, donated $5.8 billion in 2020 alone, and she gave it to 500 different groups. Bezos probably felt bad about that because he himself anted up another $1 billion for charitable causes. And so you'd say, the Bezos were, were generous people. Between the two of them, $6.8 billion dollars. And yet, Mackenzie Scott's net worth is still estimated at $49 billion, and Jeff Bezos' net worth is still estimated at $190 billion. They didn't give up their lunch money. In fact, if you take those 25 givers, and you know that they gave $20 billion among them for charity just last year alone, in order to measure their generosity, you probably should also be told that collectively their net worth increased by $150 billion last year. So their giving didn't even keep up with their income. It's not how much you give. How much do you keep for yourself? Do you make it about what you're trying to accomplish, for example, in giving to God? Or do you make it about you? We, we look at those big time givers. But let's contrast those folks for just a moment with an average tither. A tither is somebody who gives 10% of their income to God. Now a tithe has long been the accepted religious standard. It was required of the Jewish people in the Old Testament... But it wasn't just something limited to the Jews. If you were a follower of a pagan religion or maybe one of the Greek gods, you would also be expected to tithe out of your income. And, and so there's nothing particularly special about giving 10%, except that a lot of people don't do it. Think about the figures that I just cited of those wealthy people who are known for their generosity. None of them gave even a tithe of their income. And so if you're the average guy sitting in church and, and, and you made $100 this week and, and you turn around and give $10 to the church or if you made 1000 this week and you give 100 to the church or if you made $10,000 this week and you gave 1000 to the church, you gave a greater percentage of your income than Jeff Bezos or Mackenzie Scott or Mark Zuckerberg or all the other people who are on that list of the 20 or 25 most generous givers. You were more generous. And then this woman, she comes along and puts you to shame. Because she's not a tither. She gives over and above. She doesn't give 10%. She, out of her poverty puts in all that she had to live on. 
And in doing so, she does two things. She proclaims her love, and she proclaims her faith. She proclaims her love because she's giving to God all that she's got. Lord, when I put these two left in the offering plate, I, I know that that's all I've got to live on. And so what I'm saying is, Lord, I love you more than I love dinner tonight. More than I, I love breakfast tomorrow or, or, or more than I love the roof over my head. Giving is a measure of our love for God. Now, I made a woman really mad when I said that one time in a sermon. She met me at the door and she said, I'll have you know I love God. I love God, but I can only give just so much. The problem she has is that I didn't say it. The Bible said it. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 7 and 8. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love that we've kindled in you, see to it that you also excel in this grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, Paul says, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. The Apostle Paul said it. Giving is a measure of our love for God. Contrast that to the, to the scribes, to the, the religious leaders that he's been talking about here. He says, he says some of those for a show make lengthy prayers. They want to impress you by their holiness because they can pray for a long time and they can do it right out in public. Or, or, or he says, there are the wealthy and some of them like to keep their wealth. They don't plan to give too much of it. And what they do give, they want you to notice. But, but maybe you'd even want to look at where those wealthy get their, their money. Because he says, some of them are taking advantage of widow ladies in order to put it in their own pocket. We're back at the end of chapter 20. And then there's this woman who just loves God. And so she brings what she has and she drops it in the offering plate. Donna Markova told about a lesson that she learned from her Russian grandmother. The grandmother said, when you give from here, and she pointed to her gut, it's like keeping a ledger book. I give you three, so you give me three. I sweep the floor, so you carry the bundles. That's not giving, that's trading. Giving, she said, is supposed to be from here. And she pointed to her heart. When you give from your heart, it's not to get anything back. There is no owing or owed. You just give because you want to give. Our giving is done because we want to show God our love. This woman proclaimed her love with her gift. And she proclaimed her faith. All she had to live on means that now she's going to have to depend on God for whatever comes next. If she eats tonight, it will be because God has poured out a blessing if she has a blanket to cover up in when she goes to bed, it will be because God took care of her. She's given away her means. She gave away her control. She didn't have much, but what she did have, she turned loose of, and she has nothing left. And so whatever happens next is going to be because God made it happen. Tithing shows that we honor God and, and we trust Him. 
Tithing means we take 10% of our income and we give it to God. But those who tithe will tell you that somehow it seems like God always makes the 90% that you keep go a little bit farther. I've never known anybody to tithe their way into bankruptcy. I've never known anybody who starved to death by tithing. But this woman, she's going farther than tithing. She gave it all. And so now whatever happens, whatever provision is made for her next, it comes because God provided. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10 and 11, the Apostle Paul expresses his confidence that that's how it's going to work. He says... Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. Paul has used chapters 8 and 9 in 2 Corinthians to encourage the Corinthians to give and he's encouraged them to give sacrificially. But he tells them if you're giving, if, if you're putting God first, I'm confident that God will take care of you. you. You will be enriched in every way, but not just so that you can go home with plenty, but so that you'll be able to continue to be generous in the future. God will enrich you in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. Paul doesn't think that you have anything to worry about when you put God first. Maybe that's because he's heard the promise of Jesus himself. Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 through 33. Don't worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? Pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom, and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Jesus said it. Just put God first, and the rest takes care of itself. That's what the woman was trusting in that day when she dropped her two lepta into that offering plate. God will take care of me. Her gift proclaimed her love. God, I love you more than I love dinner. I love you more than I love life. I, I love you. Her gift proclaimed her faith. God, I know that you will take care of me. I know that even if I'm putting in all that I've got left, somehow you will provide and I trust you. We could ask some questions about this woman, but they are not answered in Scripture. We'd like to know her name, her age, how long she's been a widow, what's her hometown. Does she have any kids who ought to be taking care of her and apparently are not doing such a great job? We've got all sorts of questions. But no answers. She's one of those unsung heroes who steps onto the pages of Scripture and by her actions she tells us everything about her priorities in life. And then she steps off the stage and the focus is not on her. It's just on her love and her faith. Dr. Craig Hood says there are three kinds of givers in the world. He says some people are flint givers. If you strike them, they spark. And so there are people that when they're struck by a cause, when, when they hear about some need or something that excites them a little bit, they'll dig down in their wallet and they'll be a little bit more generous. They are struck by the need 
They are excited about the opportunity to do good. Craig Hood says, some are sponges. They are people who give when you put the squeeze on them. You can make these people feel guilty enough that maybe they'll cough something up. You, you talk about how much they have and how little some others have. You talk about how great the need is and you squeeze and you get a little. But then Hood says, some people are honeycomb givers. They are just so full that it oozes out and sweetens everything. And I think this woman is a pretty good example of a honeycomb giver. She steps onto the stage of Scripture and the sweetness and the love and the faith just oozes out of her. And 2,000 years later, our lives are enriched by her story. That's the kind of giver I'd like to be. We're going to close our service this morning with an invitation hymn. God wants you to give. But if you think it starts and ends with money, you are dead wrong. That's not nearly enough. What God wants most from you is all of your life. He wants to take all of your sin and trade it for all of his cleanliness. He wants to take all your past and your mistakes and the things that you're ashamed of and trade them for a future that is bright where you will be welcomed to an eternity in heaven. Jesus died to make that possible. And what he asks of you is that you give him your life and you come follow him. We talked in Sunday school class this morning about the fact that that might not be easy. Anybody who wants to follow Jesus has to take up their cross daily and follow. It will be difficult, but it's rewarding. If you're ready to follow Christ, then as we stand and sing this morning, you come forward.
think it's been six Sundays since I've been out here between junior church and uh, preschool, but man, you're getting loaded on me today, aren't you? <laughs> um, I might just mention there, as far as the, uh, and it's, it's in your bulletin there, um, we do have church directories back on the table. Please pick those up. Hope everybody's in there. If there's some mistakes in there, if you notice it, please let us know so we can uh, uh, get that taken care of. Uh, I'd also made a comment if you'd like a, a print, if that's something you're like, well, that's a good picture of the family, get with um, uh, Mark or Pam, somebody there, and we'll get you a print there. Um, we've also got on the um, August 28th coming up, uh, two weeks from today, 5 to 7 p.m., taking a ride on the Valley Gym. Uh, it'd be $10 a person or $20 per family. So we'd like to have everybody come. It's going to be a potluck, so looking forward to that. So uh, Also, I might mention, still need some helpers for the nursery, so if you're willing to work in that capacity, please get a hold of Pam or Mark or one of us. Uh, and then we got a ladies' retreat coming up here in the middle of September, about a month from now. So any other announcements that need to be made? In the way of prayer updates, um, this is, man, these are my notes not on here, but <laughs> we had... Uh, we had, um, I think there was uh, three additions this morning. Um, Mr. West, was Jeremy West passed away, 43 years old, very unexpected. So keep the Jeremy West family in your prayers. Um, anything else I can think of about that? Um, Kyle? Oh, okay. I was going to say, we did get a great report back on Kyle Hemby. Uh, we had him on the prayer list, um, and uh, you know, he had some spine issues, went through some major surgery, uh, six-year-old, and uh, man, got a great report back, so that would be on, on Kyle. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yes, that's the Kyle Rudder that, uh, that was on there, 16-year-old, uh, fighting cancer. So I apologize. I didn't have my notes with me here. Any other updates? Okay, a word of prayer and go right to it. Dear Lord God and Father, um, it's always great to be with Christian brothers and sisters uh, within the walls of this church, Lord. Um, but we know that um, as we step outside these walls, Lord, that's when we really need to be um, a Christian in the way we uh, walk our walk of life. I pray, Lord, that uh, we can be a light that shines for you in the way that we act and react to all situations. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'll be with us as we go about our daily walk of life. Help us, Lord, to um, lean on one another in our times of troubles. Uh, Lord, we're all just uh, people dealing with problems on a daily basis, and I just pray, Lord, that we can seek out Christian counsel for those times. Lord, I do pray you'll be with those that we mentioned on the prayer list here, um, lost loved ones, uh, dealing with cancer. Uh, Lord, uh, even the great news of, uh, of a good report of a young man that's, uh, that's doing well, uh, Lord, that's uplifting. But Lord, I pray as, a, um, as friends and family that we do reach out to those in need. And Lord, that um, um, as just Mark shared this morning, Lord, uh, that we give as we need to be at either limit of our time, our talent, our money, whatever it is that we can do to, to make a difference, Lord. So be with us as we go about our daily walk of life. Bring us back together. We might... Uh, study and uh, worship together once more. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.